During our last episode, we watched Brandon Slay end his sophomore year with a respectable showing at the Espoir National Championships. After that tournament, his head coach, Roger Reyna, flew to Atlanta, Georgia for the Senior World Championships. They're held during the three years in between the Olympics and are the pinnacle of the international season. That year, Americans had a lot to be excited for because Team USA won the team title and put a ton of wrestlers on the podium. But it was also most Americans' first time watching a young Russian phenom, Bovisar Satiev. Bovisar Satiev. Satiev of Russia. And so to be at the World Championships, to see Satiev, you know, break through was really impressive. And, um, and he was young. Satiev was young at the time. That's Roger Reyna. He was inside the arena as Satiev, who was just 20 years old at the time, won five matches in dominant fashion to make the world finals. You know, like how does this, you know, thin, you know, teenager, you know, come in here and, and start dominating the way he did? Um, foot sweeps, um, you know, just shrugs, clever leg attacks, you know, capable of scoring in a lot of different ways. In the world finals, wearing a solid blue singlet with a black knee brace, the baby-faced Satiev took out the defending champ, Alex Leopold of Germany, 4-2. At just 20 years old, he was now the world champion. You're listening to Slaying Satiev, Episode 2. Our story begins in the Soviet Union at 5 a.m. on February 23, 1944. Soviet Union troops are carrying out orders for the mass deportation of the entire Chechnyan population. Chechnya is a tiny republic that sits more than a thousand miles south of Moscow. It lies on the north side of Europe's highest mountain range, the Caucasus. It's remote, rugged, and one of the most lawless fronts in all of Russia. And the Chechnyans, the mountain people who live there, are known to be the most rebellious in all of the Soviet Union. For over 300 years, they've ruthlessly resisted Russian rule. But after World War II, Stalin accused the Chechnyans of helping the Nazis and ordered that the entire population be liquidated and exiled to Siberia. And so on that morning, February 23, 1944, over 500,000 Chechnyans had their lives upended as they were loaded onto cattle cars where they were forced to sit without food or access to toilet for over 13 days until their trains reached modern-day Kazakhstan in the northern parts of Siberia. One of the people on those trains was Hamid Satiev, Buvisar's father. Grandfather had five children. My father was one of them. He was two years old and sent to Kazakhstan. It was everything they could do to survive. This is a voice actor who's reading a transcript from an interview Bovisar did in 2011. This generation overcome such strong difficulties and then passed on this experience to us. In total, the Satyavs lost a combined 17 family members during the exile. An unforgettable horror that left deep wounds with the Chechen people. And to make matters worse, Soviet law restricted any public discussion of the deportations. And it wasn't for another 13 years that Hamid Satyev and the rest of the Chechens were allowed to return to their homeland. When they did return, Hamid settled in the steep mountain ranges of Dagestan. And it was here, in 1975, that Bovisar was born. I lived in a small town. In my childhood, we always played outdoors. Not like now where children sit at home or in some kind of computer class playing a game. We always play outdoors. By the time Bovisar was seven, his older brother introduced him to wrestling. My older brother was also engaged in wrestling. He was very dedicated and practiced at home. He taught me, and then I taught my younger brother, Adam. 
We had such a team and we all lived in the same house, in the same family. The three of us talked about wrestling constantly. Every night there was competition between us. In one interview, a reporter asked Satiev, Why did we choose wrestling? The reason we choose wrestling is... Uh, there were no other options at that time. There was boxing and soccer, but in Hasev Europe and in general in Dagestan, wrestling is very popular. Dagestan has a huge history of producing Olympic wrestling champions, especially freestyle. We have a very good system of wrestling that was founded during the Soviet times. Starting in the 1960s, wrestling flourished in Dagestan. Soviet coaches were sent to the region to create training centers throughout the land. And despite being a quarter of the size of Kansas, no one region has dominated freestyle wrestling like Dagestan has. Dagestan and South Society are like wrestling very popular. It's a religion. <laughs> it's very popular. It's very, wrestling in around very, I wrestled there once. That's Sergei Belaglazov, a Soviet Union wrestling legend. During the 80s, Sergei won two Olympic gold medals and six world titles. This past June, I met with Sergei at the University of Michigan Wrestling Room to talk about Satyev and the wrestling culture in Dagestan. Kids after after school, they you know they go wrestling room. They go wrestling room. It, 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 it always amazes me. It's not Greek or Roman there. Only freestyle. They have few guys who wrestle successful Greek or Roman, but usually it's freestyle. It, it, it's a part of culture. It's a big part of culture. So. In Dagestan, wrestling is their pro sport. And the great wrestlers, they're revered just like we look at great NFL or NBA players. Their singlets are sold in the stores. Their shirts are hung on the streets. They're basically living gods. And Satyev, he wanted to be one of those wrestlers. I still remember a note I wrote from my elementary school, from the fourth grade, where I wrote that I would become an Olympic champion. I just never doubted that I would be champion. I have never ever in my life thought that I would fail to become champion. Despite Satyev's vision and courage to lay out his goal at such a young age, he didn't look like a wrestler. As a kid, I was quite slim and I wasn't very scary looking. A lot of my opponents used to look at me and think that they would have an easy match. But the skinny Russian fell in love with wrestling. And starting at a young age, put in the work to back up his goal of becoming an Olympic champion. As a kid, my training was very difficult training. In the summer, we trained three times a day. We were in a sports camp and we would work on technique in the morning, working strictly on only one or two techniques training in the afternoon and training in the evening. We were forced to eat uh, in between exercises, which was the hardest thing. During the school year, workouts were reduced from three to two times a day. Let's say we did exercises at six. At eight in the morning, I had to be at school. We managed to do exercises, get home, have breakfast and go to school. And most of our classmates came sleepy, but I had already ran several kilometers. That's how we did it. For 11 months of the year, Sativ and his brothers trained like this, wrestling far fewer matches than their American counterparts, but logging nearly two to three times the training hours. By the time Bovasar was 13, he was growing into one of the best wrestlers in Dagestan. He won a Soviet schoolboy title and was starting to venture outside of the mountainous region for wrestling competitions. But that was all about to change because 1988 would throw Satya's life upside down forever. Here's what happened. When Satya was 13, the leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, ushered in economic reforms known as perestroika. They were meant to spark the slugging economy, but instead they backfired, causing recessions across the Soviet Union, including Dagestan. 
It was 1998 and perestroika took place in the country. A huge country began to collapse. Problems emerged in general for people. Many people were not as wealthy as they are now. Our society was in serious crisis. Many people lost their jobs. As poverty rippled across the Soviet Union, another tragedy happened in the Satya family. Bovasar's father, Hamid, lost his life in a car crash. It was difficult, of course, for my family and for me. Personally, I very often think that I miss my father. I miss him every day. The father was such an authority figure in the family that we could not imagine life without him. God bless our mom, who after our father had passed away, managed to save our family and show us the right way in life. Satyev's mom, Beliza Satyev, was left to raise nine children on her own. It was 1988 and my mom was 43 years old. She became the only person in our family who worked. She was the only person who could officially work. Back then, you could not have any kind of extra income. You couldn't have private business activities because it was the Soviet Union. It was forbidden to resell things. Life was completely different during the Soviet times. By the time Satya was 17, the Soviet Union had officially collapsed and Dagestan's poverty levels were nearly third world. Outside of the chaos and violence of everyday life in Dagestan, on the mat, Satya was still developing into a national talent, but needed stability, resources to travel, and a coach who could take his game to the next level. When I graduated from school, I had to decide on my future in wrestling. In Hasavyurt, there was no opportunity for me to grow further. I needed to get out of Hasavyurt to a large city so that I could continue to improve. Satya's older brother had told Bovasar about a legendary coach who lived in Siberia, a trainer of champions named Dmitry Mindishvili. But the only problem was that Siberia was over 2,900 miles away and Dagestan was in the middle of an economic depression. But against all odds, the Satyavs raised enough money to purchase Bovasar, a one-way flight. And so in September of 1992, just when most Americans are heading off for college, Bovasar said goodbye to his family and with a single bag of clothes, walked to the airport and boarded a flight for Krasnoyarsk. When I moved to Krasnoyarsk, no one invited me. I wasn't a high-level athlete. I remember very well the night I flew to Krasnoyarsk for the first time. And I remember this day so well, down to the smallest detail. Krasnoyarsk is one of the oldest cities in Siberia. It sits just above Mongolia and is a 61-hour drive from Satyev's hometown in Dagestan. It's home to stunning natural beauty, freezing cold winters, and the great coach, Dmitry Mendishvili. Dmitry Mendishvili is one of the most respected wrestling coaches of all time. His wrestlers have won a combined seven Olympic gold medals. By contrast, folks, the great John Smith has zero. Dmitry first moved to Krasnoyarsk in the 1950s when virtually no wrestling existed there. He created a wrestling school that put an emphasis on knowing the wrestler both on and off the mat. For most of his guys, he was like a second father, who would be their mentor long after the wrestling career ended. His first prize student was the great Ivan Uregan, who won two Olympic gold medals. Oh yeah, he has a great reputation because he was a Uregan coach. This is Sergei Belaglazov again. He was coached by Dmitry at numerous Soviet Union training camps. Yeah, Dmitry Mediashvili was very strict too. Strict? Yeah, very strict. He's a funny guy. He's like joke with kids. He was, he make process. That's why I said interesting. It's not like routine job coming here. Hey guys, work hard. Do this. It's not our style. Under a Dmitry Mendishvili training regiment, skill and technique 
were emphasized over running and lifting. If we talk about difference between U.S. and Russia, uh, it's a big difference again. Lifting, especially lifting, on here, here is they can spend more time for lifting. Guys, good looking, you know, muscles, everything, but technical abilities, you know, sometimes. Soon after Satyev landed in Kresnyars unannounced, he went to Dmitri's academy and asked if he could train there. I remember the first day we got to meet Dmitri Mindyashvili. We talked, and in three, four days, we were settled. For the next 20 years, Dmitri and Satyev would spend nearly every day together. Dmitri Mindyashvili was my coach, my mentor, and my friend. Our goals were one. We were connected. Dmitri said in a past interview that during practices, he would sit back and marvel at Bovisar's work ethic. In order to achieve success, you need to work a lot. There is no other way to see it. In a 1996 interview, Satyev told a reporter, Wrestling is my life. I can't do anything else. I can't even drive a nail. When asked what I'm going to do tomorrow, I answered, training. And what about the day after tomorrow? Training again. I train, come home, face red and beaten. I lay down. Probably the addict feels the same from a good dose. After spending nearly three years training with Dmitri, Satyev was ready to make his first Russian national team. It's a convoluted process involving multiple tournaments, bureaucracy, and politics. But the first step in the journey is the Uregan tournament. It's held in Satya's new hometown of Kresnyars and is billed as one of the toughest tournaments in the world. That year, Team USA sent our A squad, including Tom Brands, Terry Brands, and Pat Smith, who was at Satya's weight class. All right, so go ahead and introduce yourself to the listeners. Who are we hearing from today? Pat Smith. Pat Smith is one of the best college wrestlers of all time. He was the first wrestler to win four NCAA titles. And heading into that Eurekan tournament, he had never heard of Satyev, nor had the U.S. coaches. So I get to the semifinals. I wrestle this guy. I beat him 6-7-3. I walk off the mat. Bruce Burnett was my coach sitting in the corner. And he said, you're going to win it. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you're going to win it. He's like, that's their best wrestler. He said he was a world silver medalist last year, and that's the best wrestler they got. Well, nobody has seen Satyev yet. <laughs> he hasn't even won a world title. He's just now on the scene. So let me set the stage. It's the Oregon Finals in the dead of January. Pat Smith is on the mat in a red sun kiss kid singlet bouncing around. And then there's Satyev. He's stoic with a blue singlet that's a little big on him as he walks to the center to begin the match. I get to the finals, I step out with Satyev, and right off the bat, I'm thinking to myself, this is the best wrestler they've got. Because <laughs> his hands, you know, just his hands and his movement, just, just the way he could flow and wrestle, I mean, he was just unstoppable. To the absolute bewilderment of the American coaches, Satyev took Pat Smith down, turned him, and then later in the match, armed through him for four. I wrestled him, and, and, you know, I've got some takedowns on him, but, you know, he put it on me pretty good. And, and uh, I walk off the mat, and Bruce was standing right there, and I said, uh, well, you're wrong. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, that guy wrestling the semis, that's not their best wrestler. That's their best wrestler. I was pointing at Satyev, and he was like, I don't know who he is. Well, that was who it was, Bouvier Satyev. The end result was a tech fall for Satyev. An unimaginable result if you're talking about Pat Smith, the best college wrestler of all time up to that point. Satyev's win at the Uregan was monumental. It qualified him to represent the Russians at the European Championships, typically the second leg in the journey to make the Russian national team. But just a week before the tournament started, Satya received some bad news. Days before the 95 European Championships, the doctor told me eye to eye, you could come back dead. 
They asked if I wanted to wrestle. I said yes. I feel great. Satya was found to have a rare heart defect, and doctors ruled him ineligible to compete. And so the Russians left for the Europeans without Satya. In the meantime, Bubasar had found a second doctor who said that he was healthy enough to compete. And so he went to the Junior World Championships, which he won in dominant fashion. All the while, Satya's replacement at the Europeans wasn't performing as expected. And so the Russians at the last minute named Bovisar the representative for the Russian national team at the 1995 World Championships. In 1995, I was selected to the Russian national team for the first time, even though I was still a junior. In early August, Satya arrived in Atlanta, Georgia for the World Championships. He was the youngest member of the Russian national team. Johnny Johnson remembers watching his opening round matches. 95, when that came around, um, when he went through the Worlds, he ran through every single person at the World Tournament with a slide by. And he'd be posted on your ribcage so that you couldn't move forward. And then as you tried to pressure into him, he'd block and watch the watch and come all the way through. And he got everybody. Including the defending world champ, Alexander Leopold from Germany. In the finals, Satyev hit not one, not two, but three slide-bys on the German before winning the match 4-2 to two to cap off his first world championships at the age of 20. In 95, I became the world champion. I didn't know it at the time, but in our sport, people don't become world champions at the age of 20. Winning that tournament qualified me for the 96 Olympic team. Now, before we can get to the 96 Olympics, something happened in Bovasar's life that threatened to derail his Olympic dreams. Artillery shells instead of aerial bombs rain down on the center of the city. The Chechens, too, are taking heavy casualties, of course, but they are prepared for the sacrifice, and their slogan is freedom or death. As Satya was training for the Olympics, his homeland of Chechnya was being bombed by the Russians. See, what happened was, after the Soviet Union fell, Chechnya declared independence from Russia. Russia responded by bombing the capital city of Grozny. But the truth is that the overwhelming attack which the Russians seem to be preparing will create a bloodbath in Grozny. A human tragedy is in the making here. 2,900 miles north, Satyev watched the first Chechen war unfold with horror. His friends and family members were being killed at the hands of the Russians once again. It was all too familiar to the mass exile that happened in 1944. As the war between the Chechens and the Russians raged on, Satyev was faced with the realization that he would have to wear the enemy colors, the Russians, on the world's biggest stage, the Olympic Games. Just a year after winning the world championships at the age of 20, Satyev returned to Atlanta, ready to lay claim to his first Olympic gold medal. We are less than 24 hours away from the very beginning of the 1996 Summer Olympic Games. That means- Atlanta was the first U.S. city to host an Olympics where none of the big teams boycotted. On the day wrestling was to begin, Johnny Johnson was milling about outside the arena, waiting for the doors to open. It's really cool. I mean, it's the it's, it's the exact atmosphere of an NFL game or, you know, tailgating at a college football game. It, it's a great atmosphere. The buzz, everything's outside. The only difference is it's not Oklahoma State and Texas fans. It's <laughs> Russia, Azerbaijan, Cuba, you know, U.S. It's, you got people from all corners of the earth here. And it, it was just a beautiful thing. Inside the World Congress Center, J-Rock took his seat and waited anxiously for Satya's first match. I was in the, the American sector, so it was really cool. Um, and we were just throwing guys out that were winning. In the opening rounds, Satya Nash wins over Iran and Germany before running into American legend Kenny Monday in the semifinals. It was to be one of the most talked about matches of the tournament. Monday's not your average bear here. I mean, we're talking about a very unique individual, Olympics in 88 champ. Uh, Olympic silver in 92. He made his third Olympic Games in 96. That was J-Rock again, 
here's Sergei Belaglazov, who at the 96 Olympics was coaching for the Japanese national team. With Kenny, go upper body, very, very dangerous. He can throw. He can throw. Kenny's upper body is very good. And also he can switch leg attack. And Kenny, one of the guys who can, you know, do, looks like everything. But Saitiv, he can do technique which he, he never drilled. So on August 2nd, the powerful, muscular Kenny Monday stepped on the mat against the skinny Russian kid, Bovasar Satyev. Everyone in the arena had eyes on this match. As the match got started, Satyev was clingy early on, not giving the American an inch of space. But as soon as he saw it, Monday took a shot, Satyev countered, but then Kenny comes to his feet and is driving an underhook hard. It looks like he may even body lock the Russian, but then out of nowhere, Satyev stands up, welcomes the underhook, hits an overhook, and throws Kenny for three. I, I think it took Monday out of his game that he was so aggressive and had so many tools. Now the crowd was starting to get into it as Kenny was in a deep hole and might have to claw his way back into the match. But back on their feet, after a few scrambles, Bovisar was back in on Kenny. This time, the Russian was shooting a double leg on Kenny Monday, one of the double leg masters. In the Monday match, he actually tried to do a double leg on Monday. He doesn't do double legs, and Monday threw him down. But other than that, he dominated Monday. With just 90 seconds left, Satyev pressed the pace, hitting a snap goal behind, and then a gut wrench on the American legend. And he controlled Kenny. I mean, he, he literally controlled Kenny. Um, it, 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 was, it was hard to watch, in a sense. Hard to, you know, because I grew up watching Kenny Monday. J-Rock wasn't the only one, as American fan after American fan struggled to comprehend how the tall, skinny Russian dominated Kenny Monday, one of the great American champions of all time. As the match ended, Satyev won 6-1. to one. But of all the onlookers, no one was more impacted than Brandon Slay, who had been sitting in the fourth row as the match unfolded. I remember watching Kenny Monday, you know, wrestle Satyev and thinking, I mean, there's Kenny Monday. He's Olympic champion, second Olympics is his third Olympic team in a row. I mean, I always consider this guy, you know, one of the toughest wrestlers I've ever seen in my life. And when you have this young man uh, go out there and beat him that way, I think people were like, again, they were just like, wow, this guy. How do you say his name? Buvasar, Buvasa, Satyev. Of course, nobody knew how to say his name right back then. They didn't know how to say his first name or his last name. They just knew that this young Russian was the real deal. Sitting next to Brandon in that fourth row was Roger Reyna, his college coach. And I remember sitting next to Brandon, and I'm like, you know, that's, that's the guy you're going to need to beat. You know, most likely that's going to be the guy. He's young. And, um, and I think we were just like kind of planting seeds then. A wide-eyed Brandon Slay sat next to Roger as he received the message. I remember sitting there with Coach Rain and realizing, like, this guy's 20, I'm 20, heading into Sydney. We're both going to be about 24 years old. Like, this is the guy. He's going to be not at the end of his career. He's going to be at the peak of his career. After Satyev took out Kenny Monday, he went on to win the Olympic gold medal. And Slay and Roger, well, they drove back to Philly. And folks, we got to remember that at this point in time, Brandon Slay had never so much as won a match at the NCAA tournament. And here he and Roger are talking about facing Satyev at the 2000 Olympics. It was ludicrous. Not only that, but Brandon Slay would be returning to the NCAA circuit as a junior without his mentor, Dave Schultz. You see, just eight months prior, Dave was brutally murdered by millionaire John DuPont the man who had founded the Foxcatcher Farms. It was a horrible tragedy, one that still ripples through the wrestling world to this very day. Brandon Slay had worked out with Dave Schultz just the day before his passing and was in the Penn locker room when he heard the news. And I was like, you know, what? What what do you mean he's been murdered? Again, I was just out there. I just saw him, just saw the guy. And he's like, John DuPont, um, pulled up in front of his house, Brandon, and, and Dave was out in front of the house, and he and he he shot him. He blew him away, and he killed him. And I was just when you hear something like that, 
it's just it's just really hard to believe. How could one of our heroes, how could one of the best wrestlers in the United States history just walk out in front of his house on, on the guy's property who owns it and that guy just shoot him? Like, why? Like, why would that happen? I think you, then you start asking those questions. Like, why would he do that? And then then you go from shock, I think, and then, then for me, then my next emotion was then it was anger. In the following days, the University of Pennsylvania would host Dave's funeral, where they rolled out a wrestling mat across the gym floor and thousands of wrestlers came to pay their respects. For Brandon, he was forced to get back on the horse and refocus his efforts on his junior season. You see, Brandon jumped levels during his junior year at Penn. He was ranked in the top 10 for most of the season, won the EIWAs, and finished the year with a 28-3 record. Heading into the 1997 NCAA tournament, the Big Dance, he was the sixth seed and ready to become Penn's first All-American in over 35 years. That year, the NCAAs were held at the Unidome in Cedar Falls, Iowa. It's a giant indoor football arena in the heart of wrestling country. If I remember correctly, it was the largest, may still be the, the largest attended uh, amateur wrestling event in the United States. That's Roger Reyna, Brandon's college coach. He was there to witness the 17,000 Iowa fans pour into the stands to watch Dan Gable coach his last NCAA tournament. And Iowa was on a roll in Iowa. And wouldn't you know it, folks, Brandon Slay's run to an NCAA title went directly through the University of Iowa. In just the second round, Slay would have to wrestle Mike Euchre, a Hawkeye wrestler. So I was the sixth seed, I had the 11th seed, who happened to be from the University of Iowa, right? So we're in Iowa, um, wrestling guy from the University of Iowa. The Hawkeyes were favored to win, not only favored to win, favored to win big time. So there was just a lot of energy in the stands, a lot of black and gold in the stands. As the match got underway, Roger Reyna was in one corner, Dan Gable was in another, with Slay and Euchre at center mat. So at the very beginning of the match, I mean, we shake hands, we go to start wrestling, and he, like, level changes and hits me in a low single, which I've never seen him shoot in all the video. He hits me in a low single, he knocks me to my butt, and I'm trying to scramble, he rips my leg up in the air, he steps in, turks me, splits my legs where I couldn't kind of get my hips down, and he comes in and just haymaker cross face, about knocks me out, like I'm on my back, like seconds into the match. Clearly two takedown, and you know, back then it was three back points. Gets three back points, right? I just remember I'm on my back. I hear the ref count, one, two. And not only did I hear that, I just heard this. Again, the Hawkeyes wanted to dominate the tournament. This 11 seed has the six seed on his back. So I just remember looking up Uni Dome, solid white, because it's a dome. Solid white, and just here, like, ah, I mean, just, you know, deafening, like screaming. And I just remember. Where is the freaking out of bounds? At this point, Gable was standing on his feet with his crutches in hand, calling for the pin. Slay's season was about to be over. I was on the side that saw the shoulders go down flat, and, and I came flying out of my seat and because they missed the call that I thought. But in this particular case, referee made the right call. Had he been on the other side, he might have made the call because... It takes very little time, the shoulders to be planted into the mat uh, to get a ball. And I, I'm sure he heard it from not just me because my my expression to what, like missing the call, ignited the, the stands and the stands are going crazy. So fans are going crazy. So, you know, it was probably a little tension on the referee, but Brandon Slay uh, came off his back. With the Unidome going crazy, Brandon Slay was able to edge out of bounds and get a restart. I don't know if he bridged on the back of his head, honestly, or on his two shoulder blades, but he was moving fast. The ref didn't catch up with it, and he got himself out of bounds, and that crowd was deafening. This is Roger Reyna. Brandon found himself in a hole. He had been a guy who typically was a very fast starter, a sprinter, and get out to a lead. And all of a sudden, he found, him on the, found himself on the reverse side of the equation. He had not been there before. And I remember him looking over the corner and I wouldn't say he was big eyed like, you know, uh, like a rookie at the NCAAs for the first time, kind of big eyed. But he looked at me with big whites of his eyes. I could see him like, holy smokes, coach, I'm in a position. And I remember just looking him square back, like one takedown at a time. 
one takedown at a time. That was the mantra. Don't worry about, you know, four minutes from now, just one takedown at a time. So I focused on trying to get that first takedown, which I think I double-legged him, took him down, you know, he escapes. And true to his word, Slay edges way back into the match. And with short time left in the third, the match was tied 10-10. to He started getting to Euchre, um, scoring points in a lot, a lot of different ways. Finally got the winning takedown, was up. Euchre got to his feet, ran a rear stand and lifted him, dropped him to the mat, but he kept his hands locked. Locked hands in the NCAA tournament. The crowd went crazy. Now, all Euchre had to do was escape to send the match to overtime. But he had to ride him out for the win, which he did. And it was absolutely wild. After the match, um, I was humbled because Dan came across the mat on his crutches, shook my hand, shook Slay's hand, and said that may be the best, best match of the tournament right there. Here's Dan Gable. You know, when you're on your back and you're down and you come back, you got to give credit to, to the guy that does that. Because I've had many Hawkeyes, many Cyclones, many Wahawks do the same. But, uh, but Brandon Slay, and I saw many Hawkeyes come from behind to win big matches. And, and Brandon Slay happened to uh, be one of the guys that was an opponent that came back to, uh, to win that match and in front of uh, a very partisan crowd. After Slay's battle with the Hawkeye, he'd win his next match thereby becoming Penn's first All-American in the Roger Reina era. But his work wasn't done. He still had to wrestle the national championship out and try to make yet another milestone come true by becoming Penn's first national champion since World War II. His opponent was the feared Mark Branch from Oklahoma State. He was long, he was lengthy, and one of the meanest riders in all of college wrestling. After six minutes of wrestling, the bout was tied one-to-one when Branch took a bad shot and Slay went to his go-behind. And I ended up landing a front headlock, and I was so excited because I thought, I'm about to run this angle and score on him. And so I push, I pull, I go to run angle. I'd been taught over and over and over again to grab in the hamstring, what we call a butt drag. Grab in the hamstring, grab the butt, right? Yeah. And I got so excited to run angle, I end up reaching all the way around his waist. And I'm, I'm literally probably 80 to 90% all the way behind him for the two, reaching around his waist. But because I reached around his waist, I left this open door and this six foot four guy takes his right leg, he steps over the top of my back and puts a cross body right in. And I go to kind of rage up and I just couldn't come up at that period of time and he clearly lands on top. Two takedowns. Soft balance continually, and he might score here. Oh, and Branch steps over the top of everything. That is the incredible. So it's three to one now. I get an escape. It's three to two. There's about 20 seconds left, 15 seconds left. And I'm trying to sprint to get a takedown. Of course, he drops head and hand circles, and uh, he ends up winning three to two. And I think back on that, that's kind of it's nightmares for me a little bit because I think if I really would have grabbed butt drag and he would have stepped his leg up, I would have split his legs mm-hmm. and just ran through him. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe turked him, but I really think I would have scored the takedown. But because I did um, incorrect technique um, and didn't do things, you know, correctly, it cost me cost me the national title. That was the end to Brandon Slay's junior season. He had ended. Penn's drought of All-Americans, but he had also let the NCAA title slip through his fingertips. A title that he badly needed to give him confidence on his journey to making the U.S. Olympic team. With just one year remaining at Penn, could Slay capture the elusive NCAA crown? And could he make progress on his goal of becoming an Olympic champion? Let's find out. In episode three. From Wrestling Changed My Life, this is Slang Satiev. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please leave a review and tell your friends about this episode. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app you can think of. If you're listening on your smartphone, tap or swipe on the cover art of this podcast. 
You'll find episode show notes and offers from our sponsor, Spartan Combat. Please support our show by supporting them at SpartanCombat.com. Slang Satiev was written, edited, and produced by me, Ryan Warner. Story consulting by Raleigh Peterkin. Custom music by Gary Lanelli. Assistant producer Lake Waters. And business manager Tanner Warner. Without you folks, this episode would not be possible, so thank you. And last but not least, a huge thank you to Brandon Slay and everyone who participated in this story. Slang Sativa was produced by Wrestling Changed My Life. For all information about this series, please go to WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Peace!